start the recording. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Regional Transit Partnership meeting for Thursday, April the 28th. It's a lovely day outside and I wish we were all out under a tree, <laughs> but anyway, we're not. Welcome, welcome. First order of business is um, for me to read the notice um, of electronic meeting, which I'll do right now. This meeting of the Regional Transit Partnership is being held pursuant to Code of Virginia 2.2-3708.2, which allows a public body to hold electronic meetings when the locality in which it is located has declared a local state of emergency and a catastrophic nature of the emergency makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of the meeting is to provide for the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. This meeting is being held via electronic video and audio, means through Zoom online meetings and is accessible to the public with closed captioning, and there will be an opportunity for public comment during that portion of the agenda. Notice has been provided to the public through notice of the TJPDC offices to the media website posting and agenda. The meeting minutes will reflect the nature of the emergency. The meeting was held by electronic communications means and the type of electronic communication means by which the meeting was held. A recording of the meeting will be posted at uh, tjpdc.org within 10 days. And with that, Lucinda, would you call our role for attendance and if everybody will just sort of affirm so Lucinda catches you, that would be great. Um, Supervisor McKeel from Albemarle County. Present. Mayor Snook from the city of Charlottesville. Here. Supervisor Lapisto Kirtley from Albemarle County. Present. Director Morgan from John, representing the rural jurisdictions. Um, Mr. Sherman from the DRPT. Councillor Pinkston from the city of Charlottesville. Here. I see Brian. Yeah. Brian, yeah. Can um, you, let me just double check. Brian, can you say something so we can hear you? Not sure. Well, I see him I'm on here. The there you go. Okay. Uh, Miss White from UVA. Mr. Ames from John Urban. Here. Mr. Reich uh, from John. We have Karen in place, Karen Davis in place of Mr. Reich. Um, Miss Charmaine White from Albemarle School System. Um, Mr. Thompson from Charlottesville Area Alliance. Present. Sarah Pennington from Rideshare. She's not available today. Uh, Sandy Shackleford from the MPO. I'm here. And Mr. Williams from CAT. Present. And maybe a couple of the others will join us shortly. Um, we'll see if we can catch them as they come, uh, come in. All right. The first item on um, our agenda is approval of the agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Thanks, Lloyd. So we have a motion. We have a I second. second. Okay, Hal, thank you for the second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Aye. All right, next. Um, item is the approval of our draft meeting minutes, which were attached to your packet. And um, I just wanted to make a note that we did catch a couple of typos. Um, it looks like under approval of the, um, of the minutes from the last meeting, Lloyd both made the motion and seconded it, which I don't think was accurate. So. I'll, do you does anybody remember? I thought B, you were seconding the motions last time, but we can check in the on the recording and double check. Well, if Lloyd made the motion, I probably seconded it because I hold him in such high esteem. There you I go. Would have done that. Okay, it's all good. I will double check. So we need to I'll check the, on that. <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, I noticed on, um, or someone noticed on page three, I think it was um, Karen, that Jen DeBrule's name is misspelled um, under the DRPT report. So we'll make those corrections 
Does anybody else have anything they'd like to mention or? Just note that it, her name appears twice in that paragraph. Oh, good. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. All right, with that then, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes as amended. I think B should start this one off. I move the minutes as amended. There we go. Thank you, B. And I will dutifully second B's motion. Thank you, Lloyd. I appreciate all the help here. All right, so- fill my heart. <laughs> we have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any uh, abstentions? And any no's? All right. I think we have the minutes approved. That's great. Next, um, let me just say, oh, um, the meeting in person. Uh, I'm, I can talk about this. Um, Christine or Lucinda, did you all, Christine, there we go. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about this. The TGPT right. staff is coming uh, back in person full-time beginning May 1st uh, with the option for telework days, of course. Um, but then we're going to be bringing all of our public bodies back beginning June 1st. And so that would mean the June meeting of the Regional Transit per Partnership will be in person. You guys already previously adopted an electronic participation policy for when you're eligible to participate electronically under those specific circumstances. Um, but all of our bodies will be coming back come June, um, pending any changes made by the commission in the first of uh, May. Well, it'll be nice to see each other in person. Trevor, did you have a question? I did, uh, thanks uh, for the update. Will there be a hybrid option component to the in-person uh, meetings once you all start back? Yes, there will be a hybrid option for all of our in-person meetings. Excellent, thanks. Yes. And so that hybrid will be offered for the public making comments and... Yes, the hybrid will be available for the public. It'll be for um, any guest speakers or staff that are not primarily responsible for the meeting. So it'll be broad access electronically for anybody who wants to participate that can't be in person that's a voting member. All right. and. Um, just for everybody's um, refreshing their, our memories, is, it, is there a way, Lucinda, that you can send out the policy or the rules about attending so that if folks are out of town, I know, you know, sometimes with summer coming, people may be, be nice to just for us to be able to read them and see what the criteria is and what we have to do, if you don't mind. Is that yeah. okay with everybody? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll send them out. Yeah, so that'd be great. Um, and I do see we have folks popping up. So, um, oh, Brian, you noticed, um, listen to that Brian's here now. You caught him. Yes. Um, I have All right. Great. So it'll be fun to see everybody back in person in June. It'll be a great start. Um, the first um, or the next item on our agenda matters from the public. Lucinda, do we have anybody that's here that signed up to speak? I don't have anybody that signed up, but if anybody from the public would like to speak at the meeting, um, please raise your hand or start speaking or type in the comments and we're happy to hear you. Now's the time. All right, I don't see, I don't think we have any takers. All right, so that real meat of our agenda this afternoon is pretty exciting. We're gonna be hearing from um, one of our peer cities and it's about combining student and public transit. And the folks are from Burlington, Vermont. Welcome, welcome. And um, Peggy, why don't you all introduce yourselves and um, your team, you'll do a much better job than I. And then just tell us a little bit about yourself. We're, we're really very appreciative that you're here with us today. Thanks, um, this is exciting. So my name is Peggy O'Neill Vivanco. I am the Vermont Clean Cities Coordinator, uh, which is, the, we're nationwide, a Department of Energy funded. I'm housed at the University of Vermont. And I um, am working with a great team, um, some of whom are on here. Um, Mike Redder from Tri-Valley Transit, Jennifer Wallace Broder from the EI, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, and um, Jamie Smith from Green Mountain Transit. Um, and so Jen and I, um, with, a, with a, a group of others, 
um, pitched this idea of combining um, transit and school routes, some of which we already do in parts of Vermont um, for transportation efficiencies, um, saving school districts money, and eventually moving towards uh, bus electrification. So that's like our concept, um, but we do have some of these um, systems already in place. So I will tag to um, Jen and then she can tag to either Mike or Jamie. Jennifer? Hi, everyone. I can give you a little bit more description of our vision for this project. Um, and I'll be really interested to hear if you hear similar comments in Virginia as we get in Vermont, which is why do we have two public transit systems? Um, one for students, one for the public, that's really inefficient. Wouldn't it be great if we could get the public on school buses? So, um, because school buses go everywhere and they reach places that are hard to reach by transit. Um, and um, these two systems are inefficient. Um, sometimes it comes up in the context of climate conversations, energy use conversations, um, sort of transportation options and access questions. So we, this has been a perennial question in our state for years. It's been studied at different times and it's been, um, it's almost be, got to the point where it's like, can we go at this again? Like, can we really go at this question again? Cause it's been, it's a very challenging um, thing to think about, is there an opportunity to, to provide um, transportation for the public on a school bus or transportation for students on a public transit bus um, and somehow eliminate routes um, and save money um, and greenhouse gases, et cetera, for, for everyone. So we have a really intrepid group of people who have been very dedicated to looking at this issue over the last couple of years. We have funding um, from the Vermont Agency of Transportation as a group to pursue this, um, this work, as well as from a, a local membership alliance called the um, Energy Action Network in Vermont, which was really the forum for which this idea sort of sprung. And they sort of sponsored this idea and then we were able to get additional funding from the agency of transportation. Um, but we started out by um, looking at where um, the our public transit system is currently providing um, services that students can access. And um, so there's a couple of examples that we'll, we can share with you in Vermont. There have been done some research done um, for one of our regional planning commissions on the, the topic where they really dug into some of the legal issues, some of the other challenges um, that could come with this. Um, and then we've been, we did a lot of stakeholder outreach, just talking to school districts and transit agencies in the state, um, really trying to figure out what the opportunities of this concept are. And we came to the conclusion that our best path forward was to really look at how our public transit system could provide um, potentially more uh, uh, services for student transportation. Um, and um, we, we did that um, for a couple of reasons, rather than trying to get the general public on a school bus. Uh, we, we did that for a couple of reasons. One, we, we have a, a fairly robust rural public transit system in the state of Vermont, um, and uh, anybody can ride the bus. <laughs> There's really no barrier to that. Anyone can ride the bus, uh, including, you know, little kids, um, older adults, anybody, the general public uh, can get on the bus. Uh, it's not so for school buses. And we had a lot of questions about whether the general public would be interested in getting on a school bus. Um, and, and so we thought um, we, the other fundamental issue is like, we want our public transit system to thrive and increasing ridership is a really important aspect of that. Um, and obviously young people are part of the general public. And if we can make more connections that are relevant for them to ride the bus, that's great. So we made a strategic 
um, decision to really focus on that aspect of it, um, which helped us a lot actually just to solidify what, what, what we were trying to do. Um, and then we, um, we actually sought out a couple of school districts to work with um, so that we could really dive into what the barriers, challenges, benefits um, could be with this, um, with this concept. And we've been working in a couple of regions since there, then one in sub, uh, what I would call the suburbs uh, or exurbs of Burlington, which is our largest city. Um, so it's more of a suburban, um, I would say, school district bordering on rural. And then uh, one on the eastern side of the state that is much more rural. And um, we identified opportunities where public transit could serve some school transportation needs or gaps. And we've been since then trying to figure out like how to, to, to meet those needs. Um, it's a, it's a super exciting and interesting project, but very challenging. <laughs> um, and we are now focused on looking at opportunities in the suburban sort of Burlington area. Um, Green Mountain Transit is looking at, at, at expanding, potentially expanding service in that region. And we're, we're now thinking about how can we connect um, the school community to that effort and look at um, providing input into that route or those routes and how um, they could potentially sort of serve both the general public and the um, student travelers. Um, and we've also been looking at the Eastern um, Vermont area, looking to expand um, public transit routes to basically deviate for short distances to um, serve a couple of high schools um, we got quite far along on that and Mike can tell you a little bit more about that, but the school district, I think, ran into some challenges with that. But um, all to say, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, build and strengthen our public transit system by making stronger connections to um, school transportation. Um, to young people who are riding the bus, um, building lifelong transit users, and um, uh, potentially filling gaps that school transportation can't fill. One of the things we hear a lot about is that students can't access um, some after school activities if there isn't a late bus um, or something that can get kids home after extracurriculars. So if students don't have personal transportation, they miss out on on really important opportunities, which then becomes an equity issue. And we also have students that are traveling um, because there isn't a home school in their district or in their town and um, lack of transportation sometimes limits their choices. So there's, there are definitely gaps in our school transportation system that transit could potentially help um, address as well. So, I'll stop talking. There's a lot of layers to this. I'm sure I forgot things, but I'm happy to um, sort of turn things over to, um, maybe we could turn it over to Jamie who um, works with Green Mountain Transit, which serves uh, the Burlington region and other um, surrounding areas in Vermont and um, particularly in Burlington provides um, a lot of children ride the public transit bus to, to school. So. so let me just pause a minute, Jennifer. Thank you very yep. much. Just see if there are any questions that folks have that came up sure. while you were chatting, just to make sure um, if that works. Yeah, Garland. Absolutely. Yeah, Garland. Oh, thank you, Diantha. Um, so my only question at this point is the the um, age group. Are you going K, or are you just you know middle schoolers or high schoolers getting them on and using the um, the yellow school bus to just do the, you know, like the pre-K and K or, or, or what's become your model? So and for, I will say, Jennifer, Garland yeah. is director of our public transit system here. Sure. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, you have a great job. So I think the, uh, um, for our project, we've really been focusing on middle and high school opportunities. Um, although in the, you'll hear from the other, from Jamie in particular, there's younger kids that um, ride the public transit bus to school. 
Um, but we, we felt like there's just a lot of barriers with talking about younger kids getting on public transit buses um, and um, sort of cultural barriers, issues with safety. And so we made a decision to focus on high school and middle school age kids um, for um, opportunities to connect to public transit um, for, the, for the project that we're involved with. Any other, uh, Lloyd, I see you're leaning in. Yeah, introduce the, yourself, Lloyd, so, she knows, so Jennifer knows who you are. <laughs> Uh, I'm mayor of Charlottesville and also I guess I'm technically vice chair of this august body. Um, <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> three bucks gets me a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Nice. Uh, <laughs> you report it. <laughs> so my, my question for any, any, uh, any different way of organizing a transit system is how do you decide, in, I guess, what, what sort of metrics do you use? What sort of decision points do you have to say, this is working versus, I'm not sure this is working? Because obviously, it, nobody should be sitting there saying, we want a transit system to pay for itself, where the amount of money coming in and fares equals the cost of the operation that's sort of the traditional way that people have of thinking about it. And I'm just curious how, how other entities think about, about it in, in deciding whether what they're doing is working. Um, I'm gonna turn that over to the transit experts. <laughs> um, Jamie and you. Mike can handle that. <laughs> um, hi all, my name's Jamie. I'm the Director of Planning and Marketing for Green Mountain Transit in Burlington. Um, and so, you know, we, we receive funding in a lot of different ways. So there's FTA standards, right? We receive state funding and the Department uh, Agency of Transportation in Vermont um, has a, basically a reporting uh, annual report that they look at every single transit route in the state. And they look at, um, you know, average cost per passenger, uh, average cost per revenue mile, ridership, um, and they they create uh, an acceptable, uh, a successful, and you know like a chart. They chart every single route, um, and so it's pretty standard. I would say Garland probably you look at these same types of metrics in your system, um, and that's how we look at our all of our public transit routes to determine are they successful. Um, the state of Vermont currently through the entire pandemic has been fare free across the whole state. Um, we're still fare free in all of our transit properties. Um, and so, you know, when you factor in things like loss of fare revenue, it takes our average cost per passenger and kind of pushes that up. And so uh, the last couple of years have not been really a great indicator of um, the efficiency of public transportation. Our ridership overall across the state is down. Um, but you know, those are some of the things that we look at on an annual basis. Just a quick question. Sure. Um, is this is this um, endeavor statewide? Are you all working statewide or just in certain localities? Uh, the so public, our, oh, go ahead, oh. Peggy. <laughs> um, the the future of rural transit project right now is focused on two um, school district communities um, that Jennifer mentioned. Um, our plan is to, you know, potentially take this um, statewide, depending on kind of efficiencies and metrics and, you know, getting kids where they need to get and big people where they need to get um, and work with VTRANS, our um, state DOT and the transit agencies to see that this is working. Can you give us an idea? It might be interesting for folks to know what those two divisions look like. I mean, the, what size are they, population, or just curious? That's a really good question, and I have that, but I don't know if I have it off the top of my head. No, ballpark. Yeah. Um, I mean, just ballpark. Yeah. So, so MMU. Yeah, MMU is um, it's called Mount Mansfield Union Unified School District. As I mentioned, it serves um, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think it's six communities. It's a regional high school. 
Um, it is on the outer ring of Chittenden County, which is our largest county. Um, um, and Burlington is the hub of Chittenden County in terms of population. And it's, um, so there are, uh, you know, sort of as I was saying, the exurbs, fairly decent size, um, I think population wise. And, um, and then the other school district is on the Connecticut um, River on the New Hampshire border. It's called Orange East Supervisory Union. <laughs> that is serving a lot um, more rural uh, mm -hmm. areas of the state, smaller communities. Um, but again, it's a, it's a union uh, school district, so serving multiple communities. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have any from New Hampshire. I don't think there's any from New Hampshire. We do have a few cross-border school districts, but I don't think that is one of them. Mm -hmm. But I would say the Mount Mansfield um, region is, is definitely more populous. Um, so, they, so Mount Mansfield, I just looked it up. They have about 2,600 students, okay. but that's K through 12, six, um, six communities sending in. Um, and that's even, I think, smaller than Burlington. Uh, Burlington's probably like over 3,000. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. yep. That helps a little bit. Thank you, I appreciate it. Any yeah. other questions from folks? And then I guess we're going to go to Jamie. <laughs> we are small. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I imagine you guys are probably like, what? That's tiny. <laughs> B has a question, B. Yes, so to under, <clears throat> make sure I understand, you use school and public transportation for everybody and as well as middle school and high school students. And so for, for Burlington, for Burlington, um, the school district has a couple of school buses, a handful of school buses for special needs kids. Right. But the majority of the school population rides Green Mountain Transit buses mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the younger students like K, K6, there, they, most of most of the schools, them. most of the schools in Burlington are walkable. Mm -hmm. They're um, and um, Jamie, I mean, I've seen I've seen little kids on on the GMT buses. Yes, so we serve students um, from kindergarten all the, all the way through high school on our public transit system. Okay, interesting. So basically, you have merged the two, the school district with public transportation, and the only special buses you have are for the special needs students. Yeah, it, it wasn't really a merger. The Burlington School District, uh, you know, just hasn't been able to form a transportation and they don't need to. There's robust public transportation that serves um, all of the schools in the in the Burlington area. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Jamie, I think you had a present. Oh, Joe Garland has another question. Well, uh, Jamie, you just sparked something. So, um, Burlington. Mm -hmm. So they have a um, urban fixed route system or are they still kind of under the uh, rural model or are you running like a deviated fixed route service? Or what, what's, how, is the, how is the city itself being, sure. um, uh, how is transportation being provided there and then how did it grow from there? Okay. Uh, Green Mountain Transit actually serves the whole sort of northwest part of the state of Vermont. So we have um, three main areas. We have uh, in the upper corner of the state, we operate a rural deviated fixed route service. Um, in the central Vermont area, Washington County, like Montpelier State Capital area, we operate a deviated fixed route service. <laughs> and then in Burlington, in Chittenden County, that large county, we operate an urban fixed route transit. So we don't deviate. Um, on that system, we, you know, contract out our paratransit services and we just operate normal fixed route service. Okay. Any other questions? Jamie, I thought you had some uh, topic you were going to talk to us about before we started asking questions. So I'll turn it back <laughs> over to you. Sure. Um, I don't really have a presentation. I was just going to talk a little bit about um, the the way that we serve students uh, in our school, you know, the school district in Burlington. 
Um, we operate during the school year uh, 10 additional routes. So, you know, the FTA doesn't really allow um, traditional school transportation to be operated by a public transit agency, but they do allow for us to increase our capacity uh, during the academic school year. So we have 10 routes that operate in and around Burlington that sort of help meet the, those capacity needs of our fixed route mm -hmm. system. Uh, we do have a handful of just, you know, really popular areas where there are lots of students and instead of um, operating, you know, a dedicated route out there, we just increase the frequency on our fixed routes line. So if it's going out into what we call the new north end of Burlington, um, where there are lots of students, where the high school was located um, until, uh, you know, very recently, um, we just add supplemental trips to that service. They don't deviate, they don't really do anything special um, off of the fixed route line, but it's really a capacity building um, system at that point. Hmm. And then uh, in some of our more rural locations where we do have, in, in Montpelier is a really interesting example. We have deviated fixed route service, but we also just launched the first, the state's first micro transit service. So hmm. our first on-demand bus system, we're in the middle of a two-year pilot. Um, and so the school district, there were a lot of challenges before we had that on-demand system being able to meet the needs of the schools in Montpelier. There isn't a dedicated um, busing system in the in the capital region. Um, and our start and end times of our service didn't necessarily align well with the school start and end times. And so um, with the new micro transit service, it's sort of a you know a curb to curb system where uh, all of the schools in Montpelier, downtown Montpelier, are in that, that bubble that we serve. It's a 12 and a half mile square radius. And so students, um, I, I just pulled numbers the other day and 8% of our ridership on that service um, serves the school. And so that's not just students, some of that's faculty, but um, you know, it's a higher number than I actually expected to see, but 8% of that uh, service is directly to the schools in Montpelier. It's interesting, Jamie, because we're going to be starting a micro transit um, pilot um, okay. very soon for this, this area. So yeah, that's fascinating to hear. Other questions? I could talk for hours about my. Go oh, right ahead. You can tell us <laughs> no, no, just, 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 for a while yet. So. <laughs> That's that's sort of my life, um, but I'm happy to turn it over to Mike if he wants to. Mike is in a region that's more rural in the state, um, and you know, has a different experience with the schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we provide. Uh, sorry, Mike Reader from Tri Valley Transit. I'm the uh, community relations manager for our Orange, Northern Windsor County regions. Uh, Tri Valley Transit actually spans a. Well, it's a belt right across central uh, central Vermont, uh, Addison County, Middlebury area, uh, right across the couple of mountain ranges to um, uh, to the Connecticut River Valley, and uh, specifically where we've been working with uh, future rural uh, transportation is in that um, uh, Orange East uh, supervisory union that Peggy had mentioned, and. We, we really operate alongside of any, any school bus systems. Uh, we operate commuter routes along uh, two, interstate, uh, two interstate lines, Interstate 89 and 91, uh, that brings commuters into you know, centralized location in, in what we identify as the upper valley of, of uh, Connecticut River Valley there. Uh, so students are really incorporated into our our established bus routes. Um, I think Jennifer mentioned a partnership that we were working on with uh, with one of the local high schools. It was we were looking at an addition to one of these routes that uh, that would be able to to transfer students basically from one high school to another to take more advantage of those after school opportunities. Um, worked great great partnership really great information shared and and uh you know culminating in our ability to provide that service uh you know i think it was one of those instances where covid came to bite us once again uh the the real need wasn't really there at the time 
Uh, there weren't the after school programs in place for students to take advantage of. So we kind of uh, tuck that in our back pocket and, and hopefully by, uh, by next school year, that's, uh, you know, that, that partnership can actually work hand in hand. Not only that there's a program here that transportation could be provided, but you know, maybe the school district can look at that and say, hey, transportation's available. Let's see what we can create to be more, uh, more efficient, create one program in one school instead of having to replicate it throughout the district. Um, in, our, in our other region uh, around Middlebury and Addison County, we do have more of that uh, uh, deviated fixed route kind of schedule that uh, helps, helps serve the, the area schools. Uh, students anywhere, yep, anywhere from kindergarten through 12th grade can uh, access those buses and, and you know, use that to participate in community events, uh, after school programs, um, you know, occasionally go, going home as well uh, for students that live close enough that the, um, the uh, school bus service isn't being made available, but far enough that they'd rather get on the bus and walk in the snow. Uh, we uh, we do look at uh, at this service as being you know very important. Um, you know we think of it as when when we're serving a a, a child a student, uh, we're also serving that family that allows the you know a parent to work that maybe otherwise would have to be home taking care of or or transporting their student to to these other programs, um, and also just you know really the reality of the fact that uh, that young people you know pre-driver's license age are transit dependent. Uh, that's something that, you know, that we're able to, uh, to help out with, you know, reaching a population that uh, otherwise would be underserved. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, and, and uh, Garland was alluding to, you know, certainly some, you know, we're very careful about not stepping on the toes of, uh, of bus services in these areas where we're, uh, we're not trying to replace those services. And in a lot of ways, we do provide something very different but um, uh, but we want to be there and, and work with schools as as any community partner to see what needs we're able to meet. So um, Garland, yes, question. Uh, so I get it, Mike. I, I, I see what you guys are doing. You're you're making sure you're staying within the letter of the law. You're doing uh, these little deviated fix uh, these um, uh, seasonal routes to make sure you cover the, the FTA ruling that you're not doing something specific for the schools. I Actually, just what one little, not seasonal. Uh, we provide these services year round when, okay. um, uh, you know, it's the, the schools are a stop on our, uh, on our routes. And, um, you know, we really are able to incorporate those into our commuter services and, uh, and, you know, fixed route systems. Nice. Our services so, are seasonal, the, the 10 additional routes. Nice. So how long have, have you been working at this, this uh, project? Um, have, what are kind of the results? Um, are you seeing uh, a need for less uh, operators, uh, more operators? What has been the risk? Uh, has there been any cost savings associated with um, the combining of this services? Um, yeah, I mean, in the urban system, for sure, we had these, we had more than 10 um, of the, the routes that operated during the academic school year. Um, the city of Burlington, we have member communities that pay into our system that have a seat on our board. Um, and the city of Burlington is by far the largest contributor um, to the system, just given, you know, where <laughs> all of our start start and ends, you know, or in Burlington. Um, and so it was a cost savings to be able to pull some of those uh, dedicated services off the road and put kids directly onto fixed route services. Um, it, it's less to offer, you know, three supplemental trips on uh, a route serving the high school um, than to have dedicated buses doing that. And I'm going to ask a really stupid question because I'm not a transit person. <laughs> Tell, I know what a fixed route is. Tell me what really a deviated fixed route means. It means that you take the fixed route and just go to another place as needed. I, I, I'm just. <laughs> sure. No, it's okay. Um, so all transit providers are required to offer paratransit service for right. folks. Um, 
And so a deviated fixed route basically incorporates their paratransit system into a fixed route system. Oh, so if okay. folks live up to three quarters of a mile outside of that fixed route, the bus will deviate to pick them up. Got you. We're familiar with the, okay, I've got it now. That makes sense. Just a new term I hadn't heard before, <laughs> or at least if I hadn't picked it up before. Yeah. All right. Other so, questions? Do I gather that then they're, they deviate only when there is a specific call for them to deviate? In other words, it's not a, yeah. it's not a standard stop for them. Well, correct. If somebody well, says, correct. hey, you got to go down to Fourth Street and get Mrs. Jones. They can veer off and get Mrs. Jones. Correct. Yep. It's a yeah. scheduled deviation. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Other questions, folks? What size buses do you all have? Just curious. Uh, in Chittenden County, we range anywhere You're, from- Everybody's <laughs> laughing, Jenny, so that makes me wonder. There must be a joke there. <laughs> no, they're, just, they're different sizes depending everywhere. On yeah, Jamie's going to have one answer and Mike's going to have another. <laughs> yeah, so we operate 30 to 40 foot vehicles, um, mostly Gillig's. We have two Proterra electric buses in our fleet. And then in our central, in our rural properties, we offer, um, they're just 28 passenger, smaller cutaway vehicles. And Mike probably has a, a different answer. <laughs> yeah, the 28 passenger cutaway is our largest vehicle in our in our fleet. <laughs> Uh, we go down to um, uh, 14 passenger buses on some of our real local uh, uh, circulator services, and uh, we're typically running, you know, 20 or 28 passenger buses on our commuter routes, depending on the uh, demand for the service. Yeah, and that makes sense to me to use different size buses depending yeah. on what you need. Yeah. Yeah, we want to be we want to be at the right size. Uh, you know, we don't we don't want a bunch of uh, empty seats on the bus and. Don't want people overflowing either. Right, exactly. How are the electric buses working? Uh, we they're were they're actually working great. We've had a, a number of small issues with them, but it's not um, issues related to them being electric. It's just you know we're introducing a new bus into our fleet, and there's uh, mechanical you know things that we haven't had to encounter with our Gillick buses. But overall, they're amazing to be on. They're so so quiet. Um, we run them on our local routes, but with our next driver bid that starts in June, we're going to start putting them out um, on the regional commuters. So between counties. So what, what do you what find in your, you know, out? how far will they go and what are they? Uh, not, yeah. Yeah. The range is probably a, about 115 miles before we have to recharge. And that's you know, based on the topography of Vermont, which is not flat. So um, we have to account for, um, yeah, those hilly sections. And it's obviously uh, in the winter time, we have a lot of cold, cold weather as well. So <laughs> um, they don't get as, as far range um, in that weather. Yeah. Geraldton and Albemarle is not flat either. So we, <laughs> we get you. Yeah. Yeah, but having said that, we're a lot flatter than where some places where some of us are from, like I'm from Stanton, and we, we're a lot flatter here than we are in Stanton. So, I mean, <laughs> it's all relative, right? Hal, go ahead. Um, so, you're fare free now. What happens when you go back to collecting fares? How do the students pay for their fares, or how is that accounted for? Sure. Um, for the foreseeable future, all of the rural system will be fare free. Um, and the urban system is sort of in the process right now of working with our local legislature uh, for some funding that would allow us to remain fare free, at least for our fiscal year. Um, but when we are charging a fare on routes, um, the school district actually pays the foregone fare for students. So um, there's a threshold at which a student has to live away from a school to be eligible for that service. Um, to be paid for, uh, but the school district does cover that. And we, uh, you know, as a rural, part of that rural system, we are, you know, looking at, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future being fare free. Uh, we have worked with some of the schools on our commuter routes in particular uh, in, a, in a sponsorship agreement. Uh, so the schools would uh, provide you know, would so financially support our uh, our services, and in exchange, we uh, offer the a fare free service for their students and faculty, 
uh, similar to you know the same kind of system that we would use for uh, for other local employers. Is it a fair question to ask what your fares were? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. On that, on those routes, our commuter routes, it was uh, three dollars or three dollars and fifty cents per trip, depending on the uh, depending on the route. For a one way trip, right? For a one way trip, and that one way trip is probably about uh, 25, 30 miles. And ours were, uh, you know, dollar fifty for a local, two dollars for a local commuter, and then four dollars for regional buses. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to know that your electric buses are working okay for you, that you've been pleased with them. Oh, yeah. And we're actually in the process of putting in a grant uh, for seven additional electric vehicles into our fleet. Great. Mm -hmm. That's good. So, and I'm sorry to keep asking questions. You guys put your hands up or just start talking if you want to ask questions, too. I'm trying to figure out about your drivers. Do your drivers have the same um, pay, hourly pay? Do they have the same benefits? How do you work all of that? Uh, but everybody's our, trying to struggle, you know, we're all struggling to find drivers right now. I'm just sure. curious. Yeah, uh, we have multiple systems. So um, we have three uh, CBAs, collective bargaining agreements, one with our urban drivers, one with our rural drivers, and then one with our mechanics um, and maintenance staff. And at the moment, all three contracts, um, at least the two driver contracts, align on salary. So it doesn't matter where you're, you are in our system, you, the salary is the same. Uh, their benefits package is relatively similar, um, very minimal differences, but. So I guess, tell me how you ended up getting everybody on the same salary. Is that because of the collective bargaining? Is that, I mean, I'm just kind of naive here because we haven't had collective bargaining in this yes. in our area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. Other questions? Heard it is coming, um, Diantha. Collective yeah, bargaining well, is coming, yeah. so it's coming. Yeah, yeah probably <laughs> is, but I'm just, it, it, that's a novelty for us. Um, anything else you all would like to share with us? I mean, this sounds fascinating. Oh, I know what, one thing I wanted to ask you. You all have a university in your area. Uh, so, we have several, yeah, several yeah. colleges and universities. So when you say students, talk a little bit about how this wraps around with the university students. Sure, um, we have a similar agreement with you know, the universities in, um, in Burlington. So there's a transportation demand management company, um, CATMA, that manages transportation for the local universities and colleges around Burlington. Um, and we have an agreement with them, an unlimited access agreement where students are able to use their IDs to ride for free in our system. Um, and the school, the, the universities pay um, a discount rate, but they do pay for those, those student fares when we are charging. Um, and UVM in particular, where Peggy is right now, uh, is very well placed in the city of Burlington um, and has very, very regular uh, public transit service. And I would say faculty and staff, we swipe also. Yes. Yep. So you all, so the, your universities, colleges, universities don't have their own transit system. So UVM, do UVM do, the University of Vermont does UVM. Um, we have um, six, no, no, I'm sorry, nine um, compressed natural gas shuttle buses that run the inner loop of campus. Uh, and then there are some smaller like tr transit vans um, that will do some pickup pickups outside of the main campus because we do have horse, horse farms and maple farms and hmm. I'm sure you, you do too. Um, not maple farms, but, sure. but you have horse farms, right. So we have these satellites um, that um, and the medical college as well. So those smaller shuttle buses deal, deal with that. Um, and that's really for, for on campus. And then Champlain College, which is also in Burlington, they have, um, Jamie, do they just have one bus? I think they have one bus that's yeah. maybe two, that is a private contractor. This is one of my frustrations because I was like, oh my God, there's so many buses here. Um, and that does um, 
kind of really car park runs. So there's satellite parking mm -hmm. as well as um, student housing that's off the, their core of campus. So, and it's down a hill, you can walk up the hill, but whatever, they have the bus. <laughs> they have the bus. Um, and anyone can jump on that bus. You don't need to be a student. Um, it isn't really advertised, um, but they'll take anyone because they just want to fill the bus. So those are, and I don't know about St. Mike's and the, um, and then Mike, do you deal with anything on Middlebury's campus? Yeah, we have we have quite a few Middlebury College students that use our uh, uh, shuttle system. Uh, also, we have some commuter routes that run from Middlebury up to Burlington that a lot of the students will use to uh, get to the airport for um, uh, leaving and arriving from campus. Uh, and we've got, We've got Amtrak coming in the next couple of months, so we're we're be looking at a whole new uh, new type of service or or new uh, demands that'll be out there for for accessing the trains as well. We're sure, uh, and yes, I think same similar kind of arrangement. You know, we uh, we work with Middlebury College on on sponsorship agreements to uh, to provide basically uh, uh, free transportation back when when it, it did cost something uh, to those students and you know we continue we'd be certainly looking to continue that in the future uh, when and if fares do come back into the system. So do they utilize student drivers? Uh, no, I don't believe that they have much of a transportation system of their own. So that's where they're really, uh, really relying on us. Nothing, nothing consistent in town like like UVM would for a, you know, it's a much smaller, wow. uh, smaller scale campus and, uh, uh, you know, more contained. So they're not. Uh, you know, but they're the larger not. campus, the university campus might have student drivers. I don't know. Peggy, do they? We, no, no. Uh, okay. no, we don't. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I think they're all, maybe they're all CDL drivers. I think they are all CDL. Yeah. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. most, universities are most universities are transitioning from way from using student drivers yeah. um, because you, you're trying to establish a um, professional um, system. And when students have, you know, they, they have their studies and when they, you know, need to study, they, uh, they do so and they don't come to work. <laughs> um, so that means buses sometimes don't run. So I, I know a lot of the transitions, whether it's VCU here in, in, in Virginia, um, UVA is starting to do the same thing. I was going to say it's UVA because I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all starting to do the, the same thing. Yeah. Um, that makes getting sense. away from that student model. Yeah, makes sense. Other questions? Any uh, any other? Actually, I guess we can ask Kendall. I mean, he he can speak about the, the student population piece um, more more so than I can. Well, that's well, true. We, do we, have we would love to hire hundreds of them if they wanted to work. Um, <laughs> that's that's kind of been our problem. We've gotten away from it not by choice but by necessity. They just don't mm -hmm. need to have jobs. So they don't need the money. They're not hungry enough, Kendall. I guess so. That's, they all drive their Mercedes and their BMWs. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about UVA college students. Okay. Um, interesting. Any other questions? Nobody? Do you all have any other nuggets you want to share with us? Oh, one question. Garland has his hand up. Yeah, I just had one question. I'm, I'm sorry. So you said the university, you, you offer a discount to the university for the fares? We do. How, do you, how do you do that? Uh, we, we, what we do is uh, we offer them a 28% discount off of our cash fare um, and it's a per swipe. So they use their ID in our fare box system. They swipe for their ride and we pull um, monthly billing reports. Well, are you, are you, I assume you have federally fund your, your vehicles and your operation is federally funded also. Yeah. So how are you getting around the, so the feds are, uh, concerned about deep discounting their fare because they're already supplementing the fare structure. So how are you getting around that and giving a discount? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That would be our finance department. Okay. Is this, <laughs> is this meeting being recorded? Yes. 
Sorry. But I think um, like, you know, what Jamie was saying is we do work with um, transportation demand management um, organization that um, they worked with, with, it's called the Hill Institutions. They worked with like the Medical Center, Champlain College and the University of Vermont to reduce the number of um, single occupancy vehicles that were coming into this area, like at the same time um, and leaving at the same time. So sort of that's a little bit of the kind of historic relationship with CATMA, that um, transportation demand management and um, the institutions and, and transit. So it really does, it serves the purpose like from the, from the university's point of view and from the resident's point of view, because I live near here, is um, to really reduce a lot of the traffic that had been here historically. And we don't just receive federal funding in that system. We also receive state funding. Um, and so I don't know if that's maybe what sort of gets us around that part. And I do know that we, the revenue that we receive um, from the universities is actually just considered local dollars and not, uh, we use that to match federal dollars. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask one more question. Do you all have anything that you could, after this meeting, you know, over the next few days, that you could send us about your programs or your offerings that would be helpful for us? Just electronically, you know? Maybe send them to Lucinda and she can share them out. If that would work. I'm, I personally am especially interested in this, the high school and the middle school transportation piece. I think that we've been talking a little bit about that around the edges as well, you know, trying to figure out how that might. Because we have, we have two city, a city and a county, and right now in the urban ring, they're, and even in the city, they're crossing each other. <laughs> Seems kind of trying to figure out what to do about that. Garland. I just have one question because I know your folks are really smart and they're not going to get yourself get you guys in trouble. So I'm assuming that your fair structure policy has a, a discount for students. Is that what it is? Uh, it's Your actually, yeah, it's not spelled out in our discount policy. So it's interesting um, that you're bringing that up and I can definitely do a little more research and try to get an answer on that. No, you don't need to. I'm just saying that's probably how you're, you're using yeah, the, the, the policy. Yeah, it's possible. We don't have an official tariff. Um, but we're developing one, which you know would definitely include that. There is, um, we do have a a policy for our TDM arrangement, um, which would, you know I guess could, could be included in the tariff. The reason I'm asking is because I guess if you're you're uh, if you have a student policy that says the students only pay let's say 75 cents, and you have the age range to be like 19 or 20, then mm -hmm. that kind of fits the student model at the university, and you could probably you're probably going under that 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 premise that you know these are all less than 21 year old people right we do have that in place for our local students so there is a discount fair policy for our kindergarten through high school yeah. okay that's probably how you're doing it all right makes sense and how, and how well received for the for the kindergarten through high school i'm assuming that that right the offerings of the transit bus, the parents received it well, or you have a number of students using it, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of students using it. Um, I do think it's well received. I guess one thing that we sort of talked about before this meeting that didn't come up today is um, they all those routes are open to the general public, whether or not the general commuting public wants to ride with elementary school students is a different question. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty, they're pretty well received uh, by parents. It's a good option to get kids to and from school, um, but they're not the most popular for general public use. Yeah. yeah. And, and in some of the more rural areas that we serve, um, Vermont, actually is, you know, throughout the state having concerns with some of the smaller schools and smaller communities closing down, uh, which on one hand is, is wonderful that, you know, parents living in that town, families living in that town are, are able to choose where, uh, where their kids attend school, but transportation becomes a much larger, uh, mm -hmm. larger concern. Um, and, and, you know, where uh, the benefit side of a family gets to choose where they send their kids, but 
if if both parents are working in a in a northerly direction, well, maybe the best school for the for the child is to the south, but they have no way to access that school. So, uh, you know, for for some of the transportation that we've provided to some of the um, uh, the high schools in the area, it's been a you know a real blessing for those for those families to really open up their their options and help them seek out what they feel is the best opportunities for their kids. And I just, if I could just add maybe a, a word more about um, the Burlington piece is that there, um, like there aren't, it's, it's not like you can choose, oh, do I get a school bus or do I get a transit bus? If you want to go to school, you walk, you bike, or you take the bus. And for, again, because there are a lot of neighborhood schools, there's six elementary schools, two middle schools and one high school. Um, a lot of these schools are neighborhood schools. So there really isn't a need. It's really more for the middle school and high school where kids really develop a lot more independence. Mm -hmm. We did do a focus group uh, for the, the high school students on their perceptions. And some had never ridden a yellow school bus except for, for sports. And their comments were that they feel bad for the kids who have to ride yellow school buses because um, they found the school bus drivers not as friendly only because they had their kind of regular, usually guy, their regular bus guy who rode, who drove the GMT bus. Mm -hmm. um, and these kids do multiple sports. So they could, um, you know, my kid went on the bus with her skis and she's like, gosh, how do people get on and off a school bus with their ski? their skis. So, so I think it's because, I know, because this is what their reality, um, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem odd to ride the transit bus. And, and that's why I think, you know, even um, Mike's comments in a rural area where their schools are closing because of consolidation, and then this is the transportation option, it just becomes this, this is it. So it's, I think, maybe a little bit different than taking something away or adding something. Um, and we'll see how that works with some of the uh, communities that Jennifer had mentioned we're, we're working with. Well, the great thing about getting young people onto a bus is that they learn to be comfortable with transit and they will use transit as adults. <laughs> At least that's the idea, I think, or one of the ideas. So that's good. That's great. Any other questions from the group on my screen? Anybody else have any follow-up questions? You're good? Well, this was really fascinating. Thank you, ladies and, and Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. This was very interesting. And if you do have anything you think would be helpful for us, if you can just send it electronically to Lucinda, we can share it out. Um, maybe use it at some point to refer back for something. Um, but thank you. And, great uh, for having us. Thanks, thanks for so having much. us. This is great. Thank you. And if you want to stay, you're more than welcome to stay for the rest of our <laughs> meeting. <laughs> but you might prefer to, you know, it's getting close to, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> Thank thanks you. again. Thank you, Lucinda, for having much. us. And thanks, Diana. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. All right, folks. Fascinating. I really uh, am appreciative of Lucinda and staff working on getting some of these uh, folks in to talk to us about what transit looks like in different communities. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. With that, let's go to our regional transit vision plan update. And I think Lucinda is going to give that to us today. Give us that update. Yeah. So I'm just going to give a brief update on the regional transit vision plan project. Um, in May, we're going to have the consultants here to provide a more in-depth update on the project and the next steps. Um, so in your packet for this meeting, we wanted to get you a draft of the vision memo and the public um, engagement report ahead of time because they're pretty um, in depth and long and we wanted to make sure that you had enough time to read them before the May, May meeting. Um, so in May, we will have like a more in depth conversation and take questions on those documents then. Um, and hence the reason for the hundred and some pages that I saw and went, wow. <laughs> so yeah. why we are allowing plenty of time for folks to look at it though. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna give a project overview, summarize the work to date and preview upcoming um, activities. So the project started, I know most of you know this, um, in the fall of 2021. And the team um, developed a land use assessment and a transit capacity assessment. They identified community goals and solicited community input um, from, their, from the vision for the future of transit in the region. Um, and now they're drafting a networking corridor improvements. And in June, we'll gather public, the team will gather public input on the proposed improvements and then make adjustments and the project should finish in August. Um, I'll put a link to the project website in the chat after this and you can see um, all of those documents that have been prepared. Uh, so in May, the consultants will come and present um, another project overview and then present the draft vision framework for your comments. Um, then the project will engage the community and gather feedback on the draft vision framework, including sharing um, with the Board of Supervisors in June for all of the jurisdictions. We'll be um, going to all of their meetings and sharing the vision um, kind of the draft vision with them. We'll also be hosting another public meeting and conducting another survey. So you'll go to city council as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then the pl plan should be completed in August and the study team will again present the final plan to the regional transit partnerships and the stakeholders and the public. Um, I'll, I'll take some questions if you have any, but I think that I want to save the more in-depth questions for um, the discussion in May's meeting. So we have a month to read all those pages and so that we yeah. have good questions at the next meeting. Okay. Any other qu questions right now, though? Any comments or questions? It looks like everybody's quiet, so I think they're good, Lucinda. Um, then the next one. Yes. I'm missing somebody. Who's who? I'm is sorry. Oh, Brian, is that you? <laughs> We're having trouble hearing you. Yeah. Can you hear me? I've got a bad connection. Yeah, we can hear. Try again. We can hear you now. Okay. I'm just wondering. Yeah, you do the have difference a between this. Brian, we're having trouble hearing you, and now it looks like you're muted. Are you asking about the difference between the regional transit vision plan and the Albemarle County plan, vision plan? Maybe not. I was wondering if that was your question. Um, maybe you could type your question into the chat. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. Brian, put it into chat. I don't know why I didn't think about that. Lucinda, that was brilliant. There it goes. <laughs> <clears throat> It's between this plan and the study that we're doing right now. Um, I'm not sure what the study that we're doing right now is. We, we are doing this plan now. I think it's the same plan. I think it's what Brian. <clears throat> oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So we haven't started the study for the, the governance study um, yet. Uh, the Funding was put in the budget, but it has not been approved. So we're pretty sure we're going to get this, the funding, and then that would start in July. We'll start um, after the first uh, fiscal year in July. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the difference between the two are that the vision is going to kind of be a framework for what the community wants um, and kind of a list of projects and um, services that the community wants kind of on a grander scale. And then um, the governance study is more on how we're going to pay for the vision and the projects. And um, so it would um, talk about, it would kind of study how we could collect more revenue as, as a rural region and um, um, as a region, and then um, dole it out and, and distribute it. So it would just set up a, a st formal structure for doing that. Um, which would be the authority, which would be what we talk about as an, uh, an authority. Yeah, right? yeah. 
Does that help, Brian? Hopefully he heard the answer. There we go. So they're yes. complete complementary efforts. Yes, they yes. are. Exactly. Great question. All right. Any other questions from anybody? Um, then with that, we will move to the transit providers update. And John's first on the list. So um, Karen, uh, we have a couple of people from John. So Karen, you want to start? Um, sure. Thank you. I have Ted a couldn't be here today. I will say my understanding was Ted couldn't be here today. So we were that, that's correct. Ted happy to have Karen. <laughs> Thank you. He um, he sent me his comments, so I'll share those with you. Um, he wanted you to know that we're um, in the process of setting up a uh, meeting with the other pro providers, UTS, CAT, a CPS, to um, as a follow up to their initial meeting back in February, to um, discuss um, the driver shortage issue and to work together on that. Um, John has identified some potential overlap of CAT routes with ACPS routes, which weren't discussion. So that was one comment. Um, he also wanted you to know that we are looking at a new transit software um, that could potentially handle both microtransit and our uh, mm -hmm. demand response services, um, which would be terrific. And we also include um, a smartphone based app similar to GoPass, which I think he's already discussed with you. Um, as our plans develop at Jaunt, uh, we will coordinate with the other providers as well. And the last update is that uh, John was approached by Charlottesville, um, I'm assuming that's Charlottesville City, um, to assist in finding an improved transit solution to serving Crescent Hall. Um, so those were his um, comments to share. And I'm assuming that any app or any software that John would be buying or Cat would be purchasing, you all are obviously coordinating so that it would be seamless for um, riders. Yeah, I, I believe Ted is intending to reach out to make sure everything's yeah. coordinated, yeah. yeah. Garland, you look like you're puzzled, but I think you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> He's okay, he says yes. All right, that's good. All right, uh, any questions for Karen from John, from happenings at John? All right, we'll go to, oh, I haven't seen Charmaine on the screen. I don't think she oh. made the meeting today. She, she could not attend today. Um, I think she's not feeling well. Yeah, there's a, something going around the community. I've heard that from a couple of people lately. So, all right. Well, we'll have to catch her up because she would have probably been really interested in the presentation we had. We'll have to get her a copy of it. Um, and Becca, uh, who's covering for Becca? Um, I think Kendall was, and he put something in the chat. Yeah, he had to leave. I wasn't sure if there was someone yeah. else. Um, he's, I think he's gone. So we're good on that one. So Garland, you're on then for CAT and your school bus system. So CAT just completed our required um, triennial review. Um, as a part of that review, there was a section of it that uh, we got assistance from because uh, uh, John provides our ADA uh, service that uh, John sat in on a couple of, was it one day or was it two days? I don't remember. Okay, was it one or two? One, one, one day um, with uh, the auditors. Um, we got a preliminary report. Um, we're working through that and hopefully the final report from them will be in about a couple of weeks or so. Um, these are things that we, there are good things and bad things and not to get horrendous as one of bad the things that we need to improve upon. Um, and there's some, um, uh, some, some uh, just, procedural things that we need to kind of uh, brush up on, but it's our normal try and review every three years. Um, we're working through that. Uh, so uh, it looks like we actually did a, we did a fairly good job. I want to say that the team has done a, a wonderful job of making sure we provide everything to the, the audit team. So I think it went as well as it uh, possibly could have went. Um, we are working through a couple of things here on uh, operationally to, uh, as the budget was adopted, there are some timing of when we can potentially add new services. Um, so we're working, I'm working with Sam to make that uh, part of it happen um, to the extent service. And that's part of the thing we are, we're, we're extremely um, uh, limited on our driver numbers. We're actually really short. Um, so we've got to figure out how to get 
more drivers in the hopper to do the, the level of service that the community wants. Uh, so that's got to be addressed here uh, uh, at some point in time. Um, uh, only other thing is we are um, we are applying for some additional grant funding to do some capital projects. Looks like uh, we may uh, like we got a um, may get thumbs up from the state to look at uh, uh, doing uh, some some additional project here to add on to our building um, facility build out. So that's going to be. If approved, would be a great thing because uh, operationally wise, we you can make some changes um, in preparation for uh, adding uh, alternative fuel vehicles to our, our facility. Mm -hmm. So that's that's got to happen um, at, at some point in time. Um, on the school, um, on the school bus side, um, we are meeting with. Uh, a meeting with the school system. I can't remember if it's next week or the week after. Um, looking at where we are, um, looking at the summer programming, and then talk about uh, efforts needed to uh, kind of gear up in anticipation of next school year. Um, so that whole effort is starting. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen. We actually launched a television commercial um, yeah. for hiring of new drivers for a school bus. I guess about a week ago or this week, Monday. Um, it'll be running for about a month. Um, and then uh, the next effort will be some uh, uh, print ads. And then we're still, we have some radio ads that are actually out there already too. Um, then the next tranche is actually a push for um, urban, uh, transit drivers. So that'll be the next effort uh, to start uh, getting that done also. Um, and that's all I have. Okay, any questions for Garland? B. Pardon me. Uh, yes. What about um, we talked last time about going to the IRS because we're getting some of the people English speaking, but from different countries uh, that have driver's licenses and could be easily trained. And so possible. We, we're leaving no stone unturned. We're going to be everywhere. Um, okay. we, we are at a point right now we've got a We've got to get our numbers up. Um, uh, I'm right now on transit side. I'm about, from where we were, I've lost seven, eight, seven, eight drivers. And we were already um, basically about 12 short. So we're almost 20 drivers down. Um, before we can really start, we need to get that put in place for, you know, just to make the numbers work better um, because what uh, what we've been talking about and um, uh, is as we work through this model it's not just getting the numbers to make the model work it's also having a reserve in case somebody ever wants to take off or someone gets sick so you can't just say you need 60 drivers because that's what you need it, it's you know 25 percent 30 percent more just to ensure that we're going to be able to run the existing service because somebody needs to take a day off um, that's you know, clearly, regardless of whether it's uh, CAP or JAUNT um, uh, or UTS, the, the, the model is still the same. Um, you need more than your driver share um, to run your model. You need more to kind of, you know, as your, your, your backups. Do you have any idea what is causing this or have we always had a shortage problem for the last five or 10 years? We've had a little bit of a shortage problem, but it, it, I, the pandemic has really caused a, a real issue and it's nationwide. It's just not, it's not just this region, it's across the country. Um, CDL drivers um, are uh, worth their weight in gold uh, right now. They can command basically what they want. Um, and we have seen at CAT, we've seen three, three of my drivers left and go, uh, they're running by box trucks. Mm -hmm. um, and they're making a ton of money, um, not just you know going back for. I shouldn't have said that out loud. Um, so uh, uh, we're hopefully uh, more of them are not going to do that. But there is you know uh, that out there that option is for them to do so um, and, yeah. and you know, make a good living on their own. Thank you. And I hope it wasn't one of your former drivers who was driving the box truck that spread the corn all over a '64. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, it's okay. <laughs> if it is, the more, it is, come back. 
<laughs> the moral of this story is that we all need to get our CDL so that we can make some money. <laughs> all right. Any other questions for Garland? <laughs> uh, the only thing I actually had is uh, I know Peter uh, uh, sent me an email and I, I, I responded back to him. He was concerned about when we're going to be able to get service to uh, the center. And I've, I've explained to him as a part of the email that uh, it's not that we don't want to go to the center. That is not the problem. The problem is when I look at the route, which was Route 11, and trying to extend that to the center, if I extend it to the center, I really throw off the timing and the connections for other people. So I can't do it in isolation. If I move that route to do the deviation, they say, well, it's not that far. It actually, it's you know a couple of minutes up. You're going to load people a couple of minutes back. That's at least a five-minute deviation. That five minutes could mean people miss their, their, their connection hub to the other buses, which means we're running a small cert. I mean, our, our frequencies are down right now, which means they potentially are missing half the way to an additional half an hour or hour. That is totally unacceptable because what we have done is made one group happen and the whole rest of the system not work efficiently. So we're working through that. As soon as I can get more drivers, we can look at, and we're working through that with our consultant to make the model work better. Some of them, uh, the routes that we're running right now are not going to be able to have the service that we're used to because we just don't have the drivers. So we're going to make the adjustments on that and we'll just have to do what we can. We will incorporate, and I've told him uh, repeatedly and I want to make sure everybody else is aware, we are going to incorporate the center. It's just we need to get the model that works for us to make the whole, that we have to work at changing the whole model around to incorporate the center. So Garland, let me ask you a question, and maybe for Peter as well, although I, I, I think he's still here. He was talking about having to leave early. Um, won't, wouldn't the microtransit model work really well for the center? So you're, you're, uh, the center, I believe, is in your microtransit area. Yeah, that's what I'm questioning. And, but, and okay, that, so it, but that would be on the, that would be from the county side, right? Going yeah. to the center. That helps. It helps immensely. But if I'm coming from the city wants to go to, into the county, the only option there is still the oh, bus. I got right? you. Yeah. So, and because of the location, I can only technically go in one direction, the coming the back direction, because I can't get, so I can come in when I'm coming from um, Fashion Square Mall to go to, but it's getting across those six, eight lanes of traffic with a 35 foot bus. That is the problem, which means they, we can't do that because that's a, a safety concern or traffic in here would go crazy if we did that. Um, so we, we are not gonna be able to do that. So it is um, a one direction connection and other ways you have to ride all the way around. Um, so- You need some of those smaller buses, Garland. That, that's not the problem. It's not the <laughs> buses. It's, it's still sending a small bus across six or eight lanes of traffic. I got it. Yeah, okay, so that's good. And one quick thing, if you can just give us an update, because, and this is more for Albemarle County, but certainly you and I have been working with VDOT and Trevor knows about this, trying to figure out how to get um, be benches, shelters, right of way for you to put shelters on um, Albemarle County roads, right? Are, is that process moving along or have you hit another snag? I had a little bit of a snack on my end because I lost Steve McNally. He is uh, no longer working with CAT. Um, so that I has pushed yeah. that. Yeah, Steve left us Friday. Uh, it was, you know, it was just a personal issue in the family thing. He had to take care yeah. of it. I totally understand. So what we are working through right now is uh, that's come back on me. Uh, and we're going to try to work through that. But I, I'm going to hire some uh, project management. Um, staff to help us work through that. And I think that's probably the easiest way because the projects that we're working through, not just the, um, uh, the amenities component of it, but the larger project that we are, we're trying to get done are gonna need some specific project management um, experience on the FTA side. And we can pay for that service. It's just not gonna be cheap, but we'll, we have to do it um, as a necessary uh, way of doing business. Yeah, well, and I, I see Trevor's paying attention to, but for Alamaro County and our urban ring, we really need to get this figured out with VDOT so that you have the way of, with the right of way for our shelters. And yeah, we're, we're close with VDOT. I mean, I, I would okay. say that before Steve left, he did get the last request 
that they ask into oh, the good. hospital. So good. Um, I'm hopeful that that piece of it is done now and that we can move forward. Okay. All right. Because I think Alvaro County has money in our budget, at least for some shelters, because we were prepared for that. Um, it Looks seems like we're like making that happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Then with that, um, if nobody else has any more questions, I will. Oh, we don't have Neil's not here from today from DRPT. And Chuck Proctor's not with us today. Must have been a good day. Everybody's playing hooky. <laughs> All right. Staff updates then. Sandy, you want to talk about the MPO? Sure. Yeah, I just have a few updates for you. The most significant one is probably that we have the final budget allocations finally from both the FHWA and the FTA for MPO budget for um, FY23. So it looks like... Um, you know, we were expecting the budget to go down a little bit because the uh, PL funding that came through the Federal Highway Administration side was um, a little bit reduced from previous years, but the FTA portion of the funding actually increased. So it pretty much evened us out. out. Um, what, what's really significant going into this next fiscal year is that we have a fairly um, significant rollover that is being applied from unspent funds from this year just due to some um, staff transitions and things like that. So we're looking forward to um, being able to move that funding into um, next year as we start our long range transportation plan update and being able to take advantage of those additional resources to make sure that we do a really good job of integrating a lot of the um, initiatives that are you know, occurring with the transit visioning study and, and making sure that we have the technical support that we need to more comprehensively include transit considerations, um, as well as developing really um, methodical processes that will set us up to be successful in the future. So if we were going to have um, additional funding, this is a good year to be able to program them into. Um, we have reviewed the um, work program, the Unified Planning Work Program with the MPO. Um, we've reviewed the initial draft and so that will be on the MPO's agenda to approve, hopefully um, at their policy board meeting in May. Um, as Lucinda mentioned, um, the uh, draft six-year improvement program is out from both um, DRPT and VDOT. I'll, I'll drop some links in the chat here in a second. Um, and that does include the transit governance studies. So we are moving forward with um, with programming a match from the um, from the uh, MPO to be included as part of that work program, which is part of what the rollover will go towards. It is funding um, the match. Um, so just so you all know, they did already have the public hearing on the six year improvement program in our construction district, but they will be accepting comments through May 23rd. So I'm just sending a chat that has the link to the, um, the SIP, the Six Year Improvement Program. It has a link to if you want to um, make comments. Um, there's a there's a form you can go to that has all that information on it, and that should be approved by the Commonwealth Transportation Board at their meeting in June. Yeah, um, a couple of other just really brief items. Um, Ryan Mickles, um, you know, started on January 24th, and the very first thing he did when he got here was come to a meeting about smart scale projects with me. And so he successfully submitted, was it eight, Ryan? Eight pre-applications for smart scale projects. So um, we got all of those submitted and we're gonna be working to um, finesse a couple of those a little bit more before the final applications, but those were all submitted and are in process. We have the four that were identified by the MPO and then the PDC also is submitting four projects that um, were requested by Albemarle County. So we're letting them take our additional slots that we were not going to use and <laughs> nobody else had need of and, them, so. And we thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy happy to do it. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention as far as the MPO work program is just that we are working on finalizing the scope for the Long Range Transportation Program, including um, a preliminary uh, um, sort of expectation for what we're going to be using consultant services for. Just so you all know, you're probably not gonna see me for a couple of months after this. I'll be taking um, some short-term leave. Um, 
I'll be going on maternity leave probably somewhere oh. in the middle to end of next month. Not exactly sure when, but um, congratulations, sweetheart. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. But, um, you know, we're, I'm so working see, to make sure Zoom, we don't even know Sandy. <laughs> it well, it's been kind of fun. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a little secret to, to break the news to everybody. But, um, yeah, I'm working with Lucinda and Christine and Ryan to make sure that, you know, there's a transition plan and coverage and that you all, um, you know, have everything that you need to move forward and are getting the information that you need. So, um, yeah, so hopefully you'll have a good meeting in, in May and June. So we are going to insist that you send us a picture. I can do that. <laughs> I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, that's good. All right, then we have Ryan is going to give us a TJPDC's your bike and pedestrian update. Yes, good afternoon. Gonna, oh, there good he afternoon. is. Yeah, good afternoon, <laughs> Supervisor McHale. Uh, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee continues to meet once a month in the past three, the past three meetings. Uh, the committee has looked at smart scale, as Sandy mentioned, there were eight project applications and all of them, well, each of them has a bicycle and pedestrian element with the exception of one, maybe two. Uh, the committee has also been looking at or receiving updates from uh, the, both the county and the city on the Greenways projects. Ms. Jessica hirsch Allering gave an update on the raised grant at the last meeting. And uh, Mr. Christopher Genzik with the city gave an update on a few projects that he's been working on mm -hmm. and shepherding through the bid process. And then lastly, uh, slated more for FY23, there's been some interest with a few folks uh, on the committee to reignite the efforts with one map. Uh, so the committee has been busy getting updates and gearing up for FY23. All right, any questions for Ryan? And then Lucinda, I think you're gonna give us the ride share report today. Yeah, yeah Sarah, Sarah's out of the office this week, so I'm filling in for her. Um, yeah, so I put in the chat, uh, May is Clean Commute Month. We're really excited. We're going to do a promotion. Um, we're working with UTS, John, and, um, and Kat. Uh, everybody's been really helpful, and we've been working together kind of as a team. Um, we'll have a poster, and there's a website. I put a link in the chat, and we're going to ask people to share pictures of themselves on social media, clean commuting which can be really creative um, and it can also be going to school if not work. Um, and people can uh, share their pictures on social media using the hashtag clean commute, Seville. Yeah, Seville. Um, and each week we'll have a drawing of prizes. Um, we've got some bike shops and Stonefield Market has donated some um, gift certificates for the, the event. Um, that's all. I hope to see everybody's pictures. All right. Any questions for Lucinda about uh, rideshare activities? We're all good. All right. We're getting close here. I'll open it up for other business. If anybody has anything they want to discuss or put on the table, people are shaking their heads. I don't see anything. No. All right, I know you all, as I say this every time, I know you all are gonna be disappointed because we're getting out a little early here today, but <laughs> I would suggest it is five o'clock somewhere and, it, and it's a gorgeous day out there. So with that, I will adjourn us until our next meeting, which is May 26th and uh, have a great month. Thanks guys, great meeting. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.